What is it that we did as hostage negotiators? What's our job? Don't be shy. Say again. Get the hostages, get the hostages back. Get the bad guy to surrender. Sp said specific things in a specific manner to elicit specific information that we needed in order to influence the other side into doing what we needed them to do, surrender. Troy, Barbara, Sandy, and I, negotiators all over the United States, we got to be pretty good at that job. Our success rate at influencing the surrender of an individual that we were dealing with was close to 93% when I left. 93%. That is to say, 93% of the time that we got called out to one of these events, we were successful at getting the bad guy to surrender and release his hostages. For a moment, you don't have to answer this, just think about it. What's your success rate at influencing people into doing what you need them to do? The best of you in this room are probably successful 35 to 40% of the time. In fact, I was surprised to learn that a success rate far less than that in some circles was considered acceptable. Who knows the name Jordan Belfort? Who is he? Uh, Stockbroker, insider trader. Stock uh, his AKA is? Wolf the Wolf of Wall Street. In his book, <laughs> The Way of the Wolf, he said that he would give his people at Stratton, 200 leads. He wanted them to qualify 10, close one. And that was success. It's crazy to me, but let's, let me not deviate. 35 to 40%, the best of you in this room, hostage negotiators, Troy, Barbara, Sandy, and I, 93%. Why is there a disparity in those numbers? Is it because we're smarter than you guys? And the answer is no. I've talked to hostage negotiators all over the globe. I can tell you that's not the case. There's some pretty dumb negotiators out there. <laughs> but why are we so successful in the States is because we have a unique appreciation of the human nature response, which dictates negative emotions and negative dynamics drive decision making and drive behavior. You get your head around that concept, you put yourself at a distinct advantage because people start to become predictable. You can start to predict what they're going to do and say next based on that appreciation of that human nature response. Now, I know that there are some of you in here that are still scratching your head about this going, okay, so how can what you did, which was use your communication skills to save lives, be applied to my world? And my answer to you is that we're both cut from the same cloth. We're all compliance professionals in this room. Not in, as compliance in the general sense that you may be thinking about, not adhering to policy and procedure, but you're compliance professional in that you sell a good or a service and you're trying to get people to do what? To buy, i.e. comply. Even if you're not involved in traditional sales, you are involved in non-sales selling. Not my term, Daniel Pink's term in the book, to sell is human. He said that one in nine adults in the US workforce are involved in traditional sales. The other eight out of nine are involved in non-sales selling where you're spending upwards of 40% of your day trying to get people to bite off on an idea, a suggestion, a proposal, trying to move them in one direction or another, trying to get them to comply. Hostage negotiators are the ultimate compliance professionals on the planet. Do you know why? We sell jail time and we get people to buy it all of the time, at least 93% of the time. We sell a commodity that nobody wants and we get people to buy it all of the time because of our appreciation of the human nature response. The skills that we're going to talk about today, this is not theory. 
These skills have been tested and proven in some of the highest stakes conversations on the planet. These, these skills have not been tested. They were not tested and proven and then disseminated based on us conducting experiments in a laboratory setting at some university. Real world stuff. Some of you are going to think to yourselves, that's neat, wouldn't work in my world. If I had a dollar for every time I've heard that, I probably wouldn't be up here speaking in front of you. Does it matter what you look like? Does it matter where you come from? It doesn't matter what space you're in. It's not by accident that hostage negotiators in Tokyo are trained the same way as they are in Beijing, who are trained the same way they are in Cape Town, South, South Africa, who are trained the same way as they are in Tel Aviv, who are trained the same way as they are in London, Sao Paulo, Quebec, the US. It doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter what you look like, why? because it's based on that human nature response. So as long as the person that you're dealing with has a brain and a respiratory system, you're going to be OK. I will never quibble with you over whether these skills impact everyone, because I know that they do. Where you and I might disagree is the degree of impact. Because what works for Tim may not work for you. I may have to switch up and go in another direction, or I may have to work harder on Tim than I do you, because you guys have two different constitutions. But the record will reflect that the skills impact everyone. You're going to struggle throughout the course of the day because of the counterintuitive nature that I mentioned earlier. Some of you are going to think to yourselves that I can't imagine me saying what he just asked me to say. You're going to think back to that last tough conversation, that last negotiation that you were in, and go to yourself, if I had said that during that conversation, something bad would have happened. I would have embarrassed myself. They would have gone running from the room. He would have yelled at me. The awkwardness of the skills is um, the primary producer of those types of thoughts. The awkwardness makes us feel uncomfortable. When we are uncomfortable as human beings, what we want to do is get comfortable again as quickly as possible. But inside that awkwardness comes accelerated learning. Why do you think that is? Why does, why does accelerated learning occur when you are awkward learning a new skill? And that forces you to do, to do what, Julian? You, you gotta, who said that? Who said focus? You got to focus. What we're going to talk about today is tantamount to learning a new language. How many of you are fluent in a language other than your native tongue? How long did it take you to get that way? Think about that. How long did it take? You're, you take one week of Spanish. I can't drop you in Mexico City and say, have a good time. But after six years of being immersed in the Spanish language, I could drop you anywhere in a Spanish-speaking country, and you'd be OK. Same thing here. The awkwardness is going to give you pushback. You're going to think to yourself, these guys are all retired now. They're all running to the CBD store. <laughs> they're engaging in things that they couldn't before, and they're coming up with this nonsense. <laughs> these guys are snake oil salesmen. They have no idea what they're talking about. You're going to think it's crazy. but we're gonna force you into that discomfort. We're gonna force you into those repetitions. We're gonna help you to groove that neural pathway. That's what the awkwardness is telling you. That's your brain saying, hey, stupid, there's no neural pathway yet developed for this skill that you're asking me to use, and therefore it hurts. I don't wanna hurt. So instead of hurting, I'm gonna go back to doing things the way I used to do. Speaking of doing things the way you used to do, I'm not trying to change you. You are who you are, just trying to make what you do already better. I mentioned sharpening your blade. That's all we're trying to do here. 
Jess, get a little bit better. All of you have met a certain level of success in your current spaces, and I don't want to mess with that. This is just going to enhance what you do. And that starts with you being able to change your mindset about how you think about communicating one person to another. All right, his name was Mike. When I met Mike, it was probably the worst day of his life. In fact, check that. It was the worst day of his life. It wasn't probably. It was the worst day of his life. The time I met Mike, he had driven to the city where Sandy and I work with a partner of his by the name of Steve. They pulled up into a strip mall that sits on the border of Arlington County, Virginia, in Alexandria, Virginia. We called this strip mall Hostage Row because for whatever reason, people love taking hostages in this strip mall. I don't know if they had the blue light specials. You know, you take, you, if you, you get a card punch every time you take a hostage, you get a pizza or whatever. But we called it Hostage Row. Anyway, he pulls up next to a pawn shop. Him and Steve get out of the car. They both put on ski masks. This is pre-COVID and it's July. So in law enforcement parlance, that's what's known as a clue. <laughs> put on the ski mask, they walk to the pawn shop. Mike produces a handgun from his waistband and they go in and announce to take over a robbery of the pawn shop. Uh, what Mike didn't notice, Steve didn't notice when they were going into the pawn shop, there's a 12-year-old boy riding by on his bicycle. He looks over and he sees what's going on. He continues to a sandwich shop around the corner in the strip mall, tells the manager what has occurred. The manager calls us. We have two units that are really close. They respond. They deploy to the rear of the location just in time to see the back door of the pawn shop open up. And there stand Steve and Mike. What do you think happens next? Say again? They go, back into the pawn shop. they go back into the pawn shop. And then what do they do? They start taking hostages. Now, one of the things that they yelled at us repeatedly while we were in contact with them was, go away, leave us alone. Folks, the one way to guarantee that the police are probably going to stay around <laughs> quite some time is to take a hostage. You take a hostage, we're in. We're all in for as long as it takes. Make sense? Yes, sir. You guys know that. I know that. Taken out of that situation, Mike would know that. We know that that's not the right move to make. Why do you think he did it? Fear and panic. Why would he be fearful? Why would he panic? <laughs> Didn't go the way he thought it would. Why is he fearful? Doesn't want to go to jail. His plan was to rob and go. It was interrupted. He lost something that we cherish almost more than life itself, and that's our freedom. That was taken away from him in a blink of an eye. Now, now, now granted, it's his fault. But to your point, he's in panic mode. We panic when we are faced with things and there's no cognitive map developed to manage the crisis. And that's what actually sends us into a crisis state when we can't figure out a way out. And so he snatches hostages, eight of them, three employees, five customers. First time, only time in my career where I dealt with someone who bound the hostages by hand and foot. Straight out of a movie. He duct tapes everybody. Wrist and feet. He lays four of them out in front of the front door, four of them in front of the back door, effectively using them as human shields. We finally, after some struggle, get a correct number inside the pawn shop. We make the call inside the pawn shop. First words out of his mouth are what? Go away. Go away. Leave us alone. And then the threat. 
if, his words exactly were, if you do anything foolish, like try to come in here, these people are going to die and the blood is going to be on your hands. After assuring him that we had no intention on coming in, we basically got down to labels, mirrors, dynamic silence to get Keith to do what? Tell us his story. My goal and objective is to do what in these situations? Yeah, get him released and get this guy locked up. That's my goal and objective. You think I led with that? Do you think I ever led with that? When I first call inside of a crisis site, I say, William, hey, it's Derek. Um, listen, my goal and objective is to get everybody safely, out safely, so why don't you put the gun down, release your hostages, and you come out. How many times do you think I led with that? Zero. Never. Why? That's my goal and objective. Why not lead with that? Why doesn't it work? Their brain is foggy. Give me more, Tim. Their, he said their brain is foggy. What do you mean by their brain is foggy? People are incapable of deep thought. People are incapable of critical thinking. People are incapable of problem solving when they still have stuff they got to get off their chest. They just cannot do it. To his point, it's foggy. Why, why is it foggy? Because the whole, the whole dynamic of the situation is a threat to them. What happens when we are threatened? Why do we get defensive? Self-preservation, right? That amygdala fires up. It's small, it's about the size of an almond, sits at the base of your brain, but when that thing gets going, you can't think. You can't think at all. And so he's got to, the people that you're dealing with in a tough conversation, you can't get them into a problem solving mode until you first start to look at the situation, the circumstances from their perspective. And then articulating that. That's the only way to mitigate the fogginess that he was talking about. Don't come in here, you do anything foolish, we're gonna kill these people and the blood's gonna be on your hands. And then we start with labels, mirrors, and dynamic silence. And we'll talk about what those are and how to use those effectively as we move forward. Labels, mirrors, and dynamic silence. And slowly, Mike starts to tell his story. Mike says, I can't believe that I'm in this mess again. Again. You see, Mike had just been paroled six months previous to this event. Mike spent 17 years in the state penitentiary for robbery. armed robbery. He was 34 years old when I, had, when I met him. You do the math. Mike was 17 and he went in. He didn't go to a jail. He didn't go to a juvenile detention center. He wasn't in a county facility. He was in one of the worst prisons in the state of Maryland. I would argue one of the worst prisons in the country at 17, where he was exposed to all manners of inhumane conduct, up to and including becoming addicted to heroin in a state facility. That's where your tax dollars are going. Hasn't been able to find gainful employment. Why? He's got a 17-year hole in his resume that he has to explain. And the explanation is not good. Probation or parole officers on him about 
checking in, about getting a job. Wife is all over him about hanging out with some of the same element that he hung out with before he got locked up. And the kicker for that particular day was Mike had gone to a Kaiser Permanente clinic in Washington, D.C. to get a prescription for methadone, which I'm told is a drug that they give you to get you off of a drug. And he was denied service because he didn't have a copay. So they kicked him out. At his wit's end, Mike gets high, finds Steve, and they concoct this plan to rob a pawn shop. And now this too has failed. Labels, mirrors, and dynamic silence got this out of Mike within the first hour. As we are getting this information, what's happening to his elevated emotional state? Starting to come down. He's starting to actually talk to us. Why? Because we've expressed a, quote, interest in him. Interested people become interesting people. Interested people become interesting people. You start to express an interest in your counterpart, they're almost obligated to return the favor to you. Labels, mirrors, and dynamic silence. We're approaching the top of the second hour. Mike says, I know what I need to do. I'm going to let some of these people go. We're good with that? Heck yeah, we're good with that. I'm making progress. And true to his word, he unbound, unbinds hostages. Five of them come out. You guys keeping up with the story? How many do I have left? Wrong. I got four left. Why do I have four left? Steve, what? What about it? He came out as one of the hostages. With his hand, you, you guys probably have wondered why large scale hostage releases. We got hostages coming out with their hands up. You guys ever wonder why we do that? Because we've been around the block a couple of times. We know that these dummies like to hide in with groups of people. Mike was adamant. I'm in here by myself. There's nobody else but me. He said it over and over again through the course of the conversation. We knew from the 12-year-old, we knew from the two responding officers that there were two suspects inside there. Whose frame of reference are we operating from? <coughs> His. He wanted to believe, he wanted us to believe that he was in there alone. Okay, you're in there alone. His frame of reference, not our own. The counterpart's frame of reference, not your own. Most of us, we want to go into this conversation, to these conversations with all of our data and information that that shows that they should make this decision about X, and we get pushed back from the other side, and then we're left scratching our head as to why. The why is because you haven't taken time to show that you, dem to demonstrate that you understand what the lay of the land looks like from their perspective. It's all about sequencing the conversation. Tactical empathy first, your goal and objective always comes last. So from his perspective, he wanted to be by himself. So we let him be by himself. We're 15 minutes into the second hour. And he starts to repeat over and over. And we're still hitting him with labels, mirrors, dynamic silence. And he starts to repeat. I can't believe this. I can't believe this S, man. I'm back in this same mess again. This is unbelievable. I can't get anything right. Shortly thereafter, Mike starts to cry. And he starts to, as best he could, run through the Ten Commandments. And he says, this system is awful. The system is not set up for a black man to succeed in America today. I'm tired of having to explain myself. His words, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. 
And then abruptly, the crying stops. And he says, hey man, I want you to know something. I appreciate what you're trying to do. I wanted to let you know, my name is Keith, it's not Mike. That's huge. Because our identity is something that we hold very dear. And we don't necessarily like giving it out willy-nilly. And he's gone for 90 minutes telling us he was Mike. And then he says to us, I appreciate what you're trying to do. My name's not Mike, it's Keith. Now, I'm the police. I know his name is Keith. I knew from the jump that his name was Keith. Whose frame of reference am I operating from, my own or his? His. He wanted to be Mike, I let him be Mike. But the crying has stopped. What's your take on that? Huh? He's starting, to starting to think. What gives me a little pause? He stopped like that. I'm a little nervous at this point. He says, I know what I need to do. I understand what's going on. I'm going to let you know right now, I can't go back. I'm not going back. He says, I'm going to let the rest of these people go. And he puts the phone down. He didn't hang it up. He put the phone down, and I can hear him. He's starting to unbind the people. Very contrite, very apologetic. I'm sorry, big man, I threw you on the floor like that. I didn't mean to hurt you. Ma'am, make sure you got your purse. Do you have your purse? you have everything that you need? Take the rest of that tape off your legs. Go ahead and stand up. You guys are getting ready to get out of here. One by one. The last person, her name was Jill. He says, Jill, um, listen, do me a favor. Actually, he, he asked her, he said, what's your name? She said, my name's Jill. Now, I can still hear this because the, 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 the phone is not hung up. He just set it down. He says, uh, what's your name? She says, my name's Jill. He says, Jill, what I want you to do, I want you to go out there. When you go out there, find my wife. Her name is Kathy. She's a short, light-skinned black female. You cannot miss her. And you couldn't miss Kathy because she was a pistol. She was a handful. She said, you find Kathy. You tell her I love her. You tell her I'm sorry. And true to his word, he gets back on the phone. He says, hey, Jill is going to be the last one coming out. He tells us what she's wearing. When she comes out, you let that door close. As soon as that door close, closes, it will be, be over. Jill comes out, the door closed, and it was over. Labels, mirrors, dynamic silence. That's what got Mike slash Keith to the point where he realized from a rational perspective, these people had nothing to do with his station in life. He started to think more rationally than he did at the beginning of the conversation which ultimately led to the release of the hostages. And we got there primarily with the use of labels, mirrors, and dynamic silence. That is the ultimate in influencing with tactical empathy. How were my negotiators able to be that proficient? They changed the way they thought about communicating one person to another. You have to change the way you think about engaging another human being. You have to start doing it from their perspective. Your goal and objective is what it is. Your ask is going to be what it is. It's just a matter of where you place that ask, where you state those goals and objectives in the conversation. Changing the way you think about communicating one person to another means you have to change the way you look at your business or whatever space that you're in. So you need to ask yourself, what business are you in? What business are you in really? What business are you in? 
He manages expectations. What business are you in? Uh, I'm a pastor. What business are you in? We sell medical devices. You, you sell medical devices. What business are you in? Homes. You sell homes. What business are you in? What business are you in? Black shirt, glasses on top. What business are you in, sir? Home improvement. Home improvement. You're all wrong. <laughs> You're in the trust business. You're in the trust business. Anybody, anywhere on the planet, would do anything for you if two conditions are present. A, it's within their capability. B, they trust you. How did we get Keith to the point where he started to release hostages? Did I have the ability to negatively impact his environment anytime I wanted during the course of that conversation? Sure. Without question. I mean, the SWAT guys were chomping at the bit. They wanted to go. They usually do. Because they don't like sitting outside in the sun sweating. Right, Troy? <laughs> What's taking so long? Trust. We're in the trust business. How do you remove yourself as a psychological threat in those tough conversations? Because that's where the pushback is come from, coming from. You are being viewed as a threat in that conversation. And they don't trust that you're able to do what you say you're able to do. So instead of freaking out when they say no, or let me think about it, or take this out of the contract or we're not going to sign, you gotta ask yourself, what is it about me in this moment that they don't trust? And how do you get to that? The only way to get to that level of trust is through tactical empathy. 